Good afternoon or good morning community services students. We're just going to have a look at the short answer knowledge and self-reflection questions part five in the work with diverse people CHCDIV001 unit. So we went through the true false and uh, fill in the missing word etc last week. So this is the short answer section. So you get to do this and have a look at this just while you're waiting for your uh, role play with Hussein or perhaps you're doing this after your role play. So question one, it says identify how a person's cultural bias can impact Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander people's engagement with the service. So we did look at this last week, but I thought I might as well start from question one just to recap or perhaps you missed last week. So I guess what we've got to consider here is that First Nations people do have that stolen generations experience being removed from families, for example. And though you can reflect and be assured that agencies responsible for that were agencies like DOCS, Family and Community Services, Welfare Arms of Churches, as well as the police and basically overseen by government and government legislation. So we also listened to Stan Grant and so there was also his experience and his family of his grandmother being refused to have her child at a hospital because she was having the child of an Aboriginal person. So I guess we're sort of seeing that there's a lot of negative perceptions and stereotypes out there a lot of past mistreatment and injustice. And so that might mean First Nations people are reluctant to engage with mainstream services. They may feel that they'll be prejudiced against that these services are based on history. Perhaps there are things like subtle gestures that they may, uh, First Nations people may experience. Things like a subtle eye roll by a worker at a service that maybe that would indicate perhaps there's a bias. In this case, again, an Aboriginal person would feel like walking out. First Nations person comes to a service and there's no visible recognition of First Nations identity, if you like, no Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander flags, no posters, artworks, uh, brochures, things like that, that indicate a connection to the Indigenous community. And again, that may feel, that one might feel like, yeah, that there's not really an acceptance or an understanding or an open display of cultural identity. And someone uh, last week brought up too, which is a very important point, that historically Aboriginal people may have hidden their cultural identity as a main means to survive and to bypass stigma and stereotypes and refusal of services. So perhaps, um, you know, identifying as Indian or, or another culture and, you know, that might be to gain education, employment or, or medical support. So there's some of the things that we covered in, in question one. Question two says provide two examples of how Western systems and structures impact Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander people's engagement with services. So again, we're looking at Western systems and structures. And typically we could say that they're quite bureaucratic, a lot of paperwork and formalities and generally a top down approach. And so that might give the impression that they're distant and cold and really not really wanting to engage with people in the first place and more about bureaucracy and getting the forms done. And for Aboriginal people, that may not be, you know, a safe place. It may not be a feeling of safety or cultural safety, that top down approach. I guess an Aboriginal person would probably prefer, I don't say old, most people would probably prefer that connection, that conversation and that person centred approach. And other other little subtleties again, so different ways of communication. So we've got to be mindful of perhaps what's appropriate in eye contact. Um, you know, whether someone is talking a lot or a little, um, maybe a cultural difference there. So uh, I guess in, in a sense that people first, communication relationships is at odds with that bureaucratic top-down and formality sort of approach. Viewpoint perhaps that there might be a view that in the education system, the European or the system that we've got in place in Australia is more appropriate or better and that Aboriginal learning and 
and knowledge is second rate. So I guess historically for me, we certainly get, didn't get a perspective of history from an Indigenous perspective when we were learning. And it was more about this is the way, you know, history was enacted and it was certainly from a white perspective. So it gave that, I guess, the idea that one way was more appropriate or better than the other way. And so I guess you could argue that traditional First Nations way of learning was perhaps around experiencing the world, touching it and feeling it and, be, and interacting in it and having those conversations and those stories, perhaps more in that circle sort of setting rather than those rows and one person you know, dictating this is the, the law and this is how it is and this is what you will know and that's important. Again, that could be alienating uh, and certainly in that uh, experience of First Nations people and engagement with education, it hasn't always been smooth sailing and excess, uh, successful. And that could be argued that they're just a different perspective and what's placed as uh, the right way and the wrong way, certainly coming from a, uh, a European perspective of the world. Uh, question three, give two examples how you value and respect for diversity and inclusiveness in your work. So I guess if you do work, you can reflect on your workplace. Otherwise, you might be able to reflect on some of the case studies or role plays that you've been involved in since your time at TAFE. So think about verbal communication. Perhaps you're communicating with someone from the LGBTQIA plus community. So we've got to be mindful of the correct pronouns such as he, him, she, her, or perhaps using the person's name if that's most appropriate. Again, I'm going to mention those subtle gestures, eye rolling or a closed posture uh, or facial expressions. They may give you, you know, the impression that there's negative thoughts and emotions and someone would pick up on those. Uh, whereas if you've got that open communication, uh, inclusive body language, open uh, communication, such as active listening, empathy, and reflective practice, so identifying what someone's going through or, or trying to put yourself in their shoes and being led by what they're saying, that ultimately all those skills are about, that's what being non-judgmental is. So it's about taking the time to connect with people, get to know them and listen, really listen to their story. And, and that's what um, being non-judgmental is really, it's about those in, uh, active listening skills. Uh, other ways that you could show respect for diversity and inclusiveness in your work is coming from that strengths-based perspective and that person-centered approach. So I guess as a worker, you're able to identify the strengths in the people that you're working with. For example, someone may struggle with reading and writing for whatever reason, but from a strength perspective, you can see what they're really good at. Maybe they're really good at interacting verbally. Um, then maybe they speak more than one language. You've got a really good ability to connect with people from a range of backgrounds. And I guess an example might be someone who'd grown up in a refugee camp. See that as a strength rather than focusing on, you know, oh, you've missed a formal education in Australia, you're way behind in your schooling. But you can identify that they've had some real hands-on real life experiences in a challenging environment. And so perhaps they've picked up some really, really good skills in advocating for themselves and others as well as those, uh, I guess, bilingual skills, I would imagine some are from, from that background is the typical experience as well in what I've come across. And again, yeah, you might have to use some diverse communication skills. You might be working with someone with a disability and you've got to use signing or pictures or drawings to make sure that they're included in the conversation. And Auslan, Australian Sign Language used uh, by the deaf community in Australia so being able to speak that could be a real skill that you have or if not if you don't speak it and knowing how to access interpreters and so that's going out of your way to do so and that's an, another example of inclusive practice another example I can think of maybe you're communicating with someone who's using a wheelchair and they have a carer still if you're, you know you're working with the person in the wheelchair you direct all your conversation and communication to the person in the wheelchair, not to the carer. You're not bypassing the person just because they're in a wheelchair. You're not making that assumption that they they can't understand or they're silly because of a, a disability and, a, and an aid that they're using. Question four, explain how you contribute to the development of workplace and professional relationships based on the appreciation of diversity and inclusiveness. So this one's a little bit specific in what's being requested. 
mentioning policies and procedures that, um, that you must be followed when you're in the organisation to keep everyone safe. That's really what they're after. And for example, there might be anti-discrimination legislation, so laws that based on age, disability, gender, sexuality, marital status, cultural background, religious beliefs. So being a mindful of both those and respectful of your interactions based on those. And of course, those, those laws were filtered down into the organisational policies and procedures. And attending training where you can, relating to cultural awareness and inclusivity would also be a good thing to mention in that question. Question five, identify two of your work practices that help make work environments safe for all. So from a physical environment perspective, so following your workplace health and safety policies and procedures and reporting anything that might cause an accident, and that's about keeping everyone safe. And I guess similarly, if you're, and it is tied in with your WHS stuff, that following client behaviour plans, communication strategies, whether they're case notes or communication books, things like that, that will also help keep everyone safe because we're looking to use those interactions, behaviours that I guess keep people safe and calm and we're not uh, initiating behaviours of, behaviors of concern to escalate if we're doing those good practices. And our choice of language is important so we don't cause any psychological harm. So I'm talking about, you know, stigmatising language or stereotype based language. We're making those negative assumptions about groups of people. So, you know, group, basically we've spoken about these a lot in this unit, but people that have been marginalised in the community, so it could be someone with a disability, people from low income communities, the LGBTQIA plus community, just a couple of snapshots there, talking and putting on those assumptions or negative attitudes and viewpoints in the language that we use in our interactions with those people who are often been on the margins in some way or another in society. And so also being mindful around jokes, we're not going to be telling alienating jokes that really could have a detrimental impact on person. We might think we're being funny or engaging, but the reality could be to totally the opposite, of course. So up to six, what strategies do you use to ensure that you show respect when communicating with people from diverse background. So I guess we're going to be using respectful language and including our body language and you know, going to use uh, appropriate eye contact and be mindful of personal space. Maybe maybe we've got to be mindful of clothing, not being too reveal it, revealing. Um, could be something to keep in mind as well. Touch, including a handshake, may, always, may not always be appropriate. And I gave an example in class around someone from, a, a worker from a a Muslim background, uh, shaking hands with a colleague, and there was a colleague of mine, female colleague of mine, and there was a little shuttle, uh, subtle movement of the hand. So it wasn't direct hand to hand, it was more forearm to forearm sort of thing. And so that was a, a little subtlety across cultures, I guess, in terms of uh, handshaking. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I've also spoke about some of my experiences around growing up and what was on television in the 70s and 80s and so there were certainly some expectations around gender that were sort of, I guess, presented as the norm uh, and so that means that I've got to make sure that my language is respectful and inclusive. I don't expect if this female to make me a cup of tea, for, as an example, wait on me hand and foot, foot just because of gender difference. Uh, I've spoken earlier about use of the chronic pronoun if you're working with someone in that LGBTIA plus community. A few little subtleties there, but they're the sort of things that would show respect when uh, communicating with people from diverse backgrounds. I might mention this one, I, I think I will mention it again in a, in a, shortly, but maybe working with First Nations people that can be very respectful for older people who are elders and being referred to them as uncle or auntie as that shine, sign of respect is from what I've been told in, in recent times that it's most appropriate as long as you know I guess it's it's it is okay and not offensive and you know definitely we're definitely working with an uncle and an auntie so he hello uncle or hello auntie is quite good and respectful um, now question seven this question requires you to consider your own cultural background experiences and beliefs Describe one cultural view and or bias that you have and why you think you have this. So the, obviously this question is about reflecting on your own cultural background and, and experiences and beliefs. So obviously we're going to be quite different uh, straight away from gender. Uh, that, that's one uh, obvious difference. There might be some other cultural um, backgrounds or disability or ability. Um, 
mental health, um, all sorts of experiences. And for me, you know, I've spoken a, a, a quite a bit about the experiences on, uh, I guess, shaping my views and beliefs through that television in particular. It was quite prejudiced, if you like, back in the 70s and 80s. Uh, women were certainly presented as the homemakers, the cooks, the cleaners. And if they weren't all that, they were also a sex goddess and uh, 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 to be there to be ogled by the young men of the day. So, and I guess that, that sort of, presentation was probably reflected in the attitude of the cohorts of the young males in school so jokes the insults the put downs things like that we could be traced back to some sort of gender stuff you know a put down might be you know you're you're a sheila you're a girl um you know that sort of stuff get over it um toughen up your girl so i've got to think beyond those stereotypes obviously and the, you know jokes and languages uh there was certainly an L anti lgbtqia plus um or, you know, in the in the broader community, I guess it certainly wasn't the level of uh, acceptance, I don't think, that there is today, although there's certainly, you know, there are challenges for young people coming out and feeling accepted and perhaps in, in families and, and the broader society as well. So it's not, by all means, uh, smooth sailing. Um, for me, yeah, I guess some of that gender stuff, you know, making those assumptions like, oh, you've got to go see the doctor or i'm going to see the doctor in my head i need to be mindful doctors can be any gender or culture uh so you've got to look at that stuff critically you know what's going on in my head um, but do we see an equal you know in society these days a good spread of um genders or cultural backgrounds are we getting a lot of first nations people coming through as doctors lawyers politicians for example so some of those st stereotypes and practices and things that really held back certain groups in the community. And I think, look, we're still hearing about some behaviours by males in our Australian government, our Parliament House, that haven't been respectful and a safe place for, for women trying to make their way in the world. There's certainly been a, an air of male privilege and overstepping respectful and safe boundaries there. So if you've been following that stuff, you'll know what I'm talking about. But that gender stuff, so I'm just saying it's still out there and it's still alive. Okay, question eight. List two issues that could occur in communication if a worker has not reflected on their own cultural background or learned about cultural background of their client or customer. So if someone hasn't reflected on their own cultural background or learned about someone else's, there could be those body language uh, mix-ups, you know, doing something that could be offensive, personal space, touch, inappropriate touch, inappropriate dress. So straight away that could be seen as being disrespectful and you're creating a barrier that could lead to some sort of communication or, or breakdown in, in engagement. So I've got to have some in, insight into other people's communication options and preference and that means I have to have an understanding of subtleties, you know, whether, it, you know, how much eye contact or personal space is, is kind of... So I've got to develop an understanding of the experiences of these people, the diverse groups that we work with. For example, you know, getting that understanding of the, of the, the story of, the, of First Nations people, going beyond what I learned at school and, and reading different things, listening to th different things, uh, engaging with NITV or SBS, talking to Indigenous people, obviously. Um, continuing, it's a lifelong process. Refugees, similarly, LGBTQIA+. So trying to get myself into the positions that these people have experienced. So, you know, using my engagement strategies and empathy and trying to get an understanding of what people have experienced. And for guess what I'm saying for me as a white male in Newcastle, I'm not necessarily that practised at feeling that I'm in a, in a minority and that there are negative stereotypes about my group, if you like, my observable group out there and, and my cultural background. So it's a different experience to come to Newcastle as a refugee from an African nation, for example. And of course, that might be your experience of the world or likewise, you might be you know, identifying as a First Nations person and you know that, that gives you another sort of whole different background. So yeah, just going back to that question. So the, 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 yeah, it's the miscommunication and what that means. So it could lead to communication break, breakdown, you're yeah, going through those if you're making assumptions. Uh, so what I'd say about this question, you've just got to respect, reflect on your, you know, where you've come from honestly. So whether that's from gender or social housing or First Nations or having a disability or living in poverty or living in a, an affluent background, what does that really mean? Um, so you might have a bias and it's not a problem. Uh, I'd argue it's a strength to identify a bias. Of course, you know, it might take some uh, honesty and, and some uh, courage, but it does help you move forward. 
And I gave my example of waiting in a queue at Woolworths in Newcastle and someone in, a woman in front of me had that Islamic full facial covering and the black robes. And, you know, I was thinking, oh, that's, uh, you know, must be a terribly male-dominated society to have, you know, to be dressing like that. But, yeah, I learned it's not that simple. And uh, I've got that good little cartoon that I did show of um, the two different perspectives. Um, someone dressed like I just is described and we've got the more, I guess, uh, the bikini type at the beach sort of uh, thing and they're both kind of thinking, oh, you know, what a terrible male-dominated male society. So you can see the, the truth in both perspectives. So that, that um, if you haven't seen that um, that, uh, uh, that little cartoon, I'll try and get that up beside me. Okay, uh, two ways to improve yourself and social awareness. So having good supervision, uh, that's a good way. So you've got someone good in the workplace to listen, reflect, bounce ideas off, a trusted colleague or experienced colleague, that is really worth its weight in gold. And uh, really uh, listening to people and taking it on board the experiences of people that have experienced difference and, and you know, challenges. So that's really helped my under, overall understanding, you know, whether someone with a disability, first people from First Nations or, or women. Uh, also, uh, understanding multicultural events, festivals, going to multicultural services and talking to multicultural staff, that's all really good learning and strategies you can use. We've got Cage Gold coming in next week. I'm away, but Maria will be in, but from 9.30 till 10. Cage, and I've mentioned Cage previously, from ACON, representing that LGBTQIA plus community. It's a great opportunity to listen, ask questions. Um, in a sense, it's a workshop. So there's another exit, attending training workshops. Number 10, I think this is the last one, using your knowledge of diversity, provide three examples where you have used appropriate verbal and nonverbal communication to show respect for people from different cultural or social backgrounds to your own. So we want three examples. So I guess I'll give three uh, examples, but you could draw upon other examples, obviously, or some of the role plays, perhaps. I'll give this example. I already have given it previously, but if you're, I was working and supporting someone with a disability using a wheelchair, they had a carer, but I addressed all my questions and conversation to the person. I didn't bypass the person in the wheelchair with that an incorrect assumption, if you like, that they were not as intelligent as the carer or the carer was more, uh, the only one capable of communicating and asking questions. Uh, there's no correlation between using a wheelchair and um, yeah, ability to communicate. So, yeah, when working with young people who was trans... So working with a young person, I've said people, it's happened more than once, but working with, let's say, a young person who was transitioning genders, making sure you use their preferred pronoun, checking, you know, having that conversation, checking, you know, I've got it right, doing what that person wants. And I might have known someone for quite some time and, you know, years and then that transition and occasionally there might be the accidental and accidental slip up, perhaps using the, a previous uh, name or something like that and just uh, subtly or, you know, appropriately apologising at the right time and, you know, just moving on from there. But, you know, it can be, you know, you've got to work hard to, to sometimes just to make sure you get that, that correct. And we're all human, but yeah, apologising as appropriately uh, and subtly as, as, uh, as needed. Another, another example I can think of is, you know, working with the HIV community. So that's primarily um, gay males. And certainly when I, again, going back with HIV age uh, came to the prominence in the early 80s, it was really presented in a negative way in the media and it was a, a, like a death sentence and it was caused by uh, gay males in particular. So there was that sort of negative stereotypes. And I'm sure there's that sort of bit of a negative sort of stuff out there still around that. Uh, maybe again, I think I might have come across the subtle eye roll and things like that in some conversations over the years from people who, who you know, I guess on the outside looking in on that community. But I have worked on a few uh, promotional events over the years with um, um, people who are in, that, in this group. So just being positive and um, 
strength-based and, and focused and not, you know, not coming from that position that HIV is, is now a death sentence and, you know, um, you know, can catch it from shaking hands, all those sort of misnomers that are out there. People now live a, a full and rewarding life. You don't, don't catch AIDS by shaking hands or having, you know, normal interactions and respectful interactions. Other, other things that you might want to talk about out there, I guess, is there stuff on social media that you might, might have come across? You said, you know, biases against generations, uh, things like that. But, uh, yeah, active listening, being non-judgmental, all those sort of things. But I'll let you guys have to think about that. So I'm going to say toodle pips and good luck with that. Oh, contact me if you have any questions.